Great. Well, we're starting a new book this morning. Um, and we're going to be in the book of Acts, and surprisingly, we're actually going to turn to the book of Acts, um, and we will start in that book. Um, we're, we're only going to do a few verses this morning. So we'll read them together, we'll pray, and then we will, and then we will study through them. But it dawned on me as, as um, again, as we were singing and I've been chewing on this over the last little while, as we're standing singing, it's all about you, Jesus, and we're excited about that. And I had this thought, you know, it's, we, we, can, we can sing it's all about you, Jesus, on a Sunday morning, but I bet you none of us have any problem getting excited about ice cream and saying ice cream in public. Well, we can try it. Whenever we say ice cream, it doesn't feel strange. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a weird request, but it doesn't feel strange, does it? Now go into a crowded place and say Jesus without stubbing your toe. Suddenly something happens, doesn't it? Suddenly something happens. Are we excited about the things of the Lord? You know, when I get excited about something, it might be, it might be something as silly as I, I enjoy lifting heavy things. And so it could be, a, I'm, I'm looking at a belt at the moment, which keeps everything together, apparently, as you lift stuff up. Right? <laughs> I can tell you everything about every good belt, because I've been online and I have searched and I have interrogated and I've listened to reviews and I've, I've kind of even considered doing these things, making one myself or buying one, or I've already got four. <laughs> but, you know, I'm excited about this. And so I know everything about it, and I've looked at those different sources, and then I say to myself, Self, did you read the Bible this morning? And I'll say, yeah, I did. Did you study the Bible this morning? Were, were you excited about that which you read this morning? You see, I can read the Bible. You want to watch paint dry? Read. Leviticus. Yeah. You want to have your mind blown? Study Leviticus. You get the difference? You want to have your mind blown? What Jesus has done for us cannot be clearer than the book of Leviticus. But just go and read that book. Just because you've got it on your Bible reading plan and you've got to make some ticks, go, go and read through it. It's horrible. You're not, going to, you're not going to have a good time, but go and study that book because you're excited about Jesus and he will blow your mind. And it's a little bit like that when we come to the book of Acts. So we're going to re read just the first three verses and then we're going to ask a series of questions. We're going to ask, who is this, what is this former account? Who is, and, and, and well, let me not spoil it. Let's, uh, let's read it and then we'll go through it together. Acts chapter one and verse one. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, as we come to your word this morning, Lord, perhaps even a, a short passage in your word, we pray, Lord, that you would give us an excitement and a zeal, Lord, to, to understand the things that you've given us for our good, Lord, that we would know you. Lord, we've studied through this gospel of John and, and, and we know that eternal life is to know you knowledge of you, access to your presence, being welcomed into your presence, being known as a son or daughter of the Most High God, knowing you is eternal life. We know that now we see dimly, and yet one day when we cross over, Father, we will see clearly. We know that, Lord, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We know, Lord, that you're a good Father, and we know that in the perfectness of your righteousness imparted to us, we can celebrate our position, even in your presence. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us hearts of great excitement, Lord, as we, as we, come, to, as we come to study your word and not just read it for reading's sake, not just attending Sunday morning for attendance sake, but Lord, to know you 
And I pray, Lord, that every heart that seeks you, that you would meet and that you would fill them, Lord, with your joy, with your peace. Lord, with the very fruit of your spirit as you fill and establish and build up for every good work that, Lord, you've ordained beforehand that you strengthen to do. And in some incredible, incredible grace, Lord, you even reward us for doing. So, Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes and bless us as we study your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The former account, the first thing we've got to ask is, what is the author who we do not know yet? And of course, we, we come to the Bible with a, with a set of, of preconceptions, a set of understandings, a, a set of things which we're told and we just accept as truth. We're told certain things about the Bible and we, and we, simply, we simply accept them. Jonah was swallowed by a whale. Well, it's not what the Bible says. Great fish. But was it a whale? Was it a great fish? Was it, was it something specific that the Lord had prepared? Well, it could be. But it's Jonah and, and, and the whale. How many animals went on the ark? It came in two by two. We know that. Why? Because we sing the song. Well, that, that's true for you know, 99.9% of the animals, except for the sacrificial animals. They came in in sevens, didn't they? But we, we, we miss some of the depth of these things because we think we, we know it. How many of you avoid reading the Gospels because you know all the stories in the Gospels? Maybe it's just me. I feel that way sometimes. If I'm going to start reading the Gospels, I, I know what's in the Gospels. We read the Gospels all the time. And then you actually do it. And man, the Lord does a thing. There's something new. There's something fresh. There's something relevant to where you are right in that point in time. So it's a little bit like that with the book of Acts. The former account I made, the former account, perhaps going back to the book of Luke. You see, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. But Acts follows on from Luke. It doesn't follow on from John. Chronologically, more or less, it's, it's in that sequence. Um, but the book of Acts used to, way back many moons ago, I understand, be tagged on to the book of Luke. They were two volumes of one work because of the same authorage. And the same authorage is confirmed through this Theophilus um, man who we're, going to, who we're going to have a look at. But the former account is the book of Luke. So let's have a look at the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. And let's see what this former account looks like. So Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as you have taken in hand... Sorry. In as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. And so we get already in Luke's gospel that this is an investigative journalist a historian who has interviewed multiple people and one of the nuances is this is written in a very high form of Greek in the same way that the book of Acts is and so again speaking to the authorage being the same but he's put together via eyewitness in some instances but in most instances it's through the witnesses that he's interviewed he's put these facts together it seemed good to me also having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. And that term, most excellent Theophilus, the, the most excellent portion of that is actually a title given to one of the Roman dignitaries. So this was perhaps a Roman dignitary, and now again, we can't put too much into that because we weren't there, or we don't know exactly, but it's to somebody of importance. Somebody who has a title. Most excellent, excellent Theophilus. That you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And so he starts the book of Luke, the author, and we'll call him just the author for now. But the author of the Gospel of Luke will start out and give purpose and give the way in which the Gospel has been presented. Now, you and I know that, that Matthew's Gospel will, will present Jesus as, as the King. 
Right? He's, the, he's the Messiah according to the scriptures. So prophetic, particularly to the Jews, looking at Jesus the Messiah. We see Mark's gospel as, as largely focused on, on Jesus the servant, the, the servant king. Um, and, and so there's very much of that in, in Mark's gospel. In Luke's gospel, or in the gospel of Luke, we find Jesus in his humanity. And we find Jesus praying more than any other gospel. We find Jesus depending on the Lord in the Holy Spirit more than any other gospel. We see Jesus defeating Satan um, even by, um, by the word of God. Um, and so we get this incredible picture of the humanity of Christ even through Luke's gospel, which he concludes, which he concludes um, in, in chapter 24. And I'll pick it up from verse 44, but chapter 24 is a good one. I did consider reading the whole thing, and then I thought, we want to study the Bible, not just read it. Um, and we wouldn't have time. But, but in verse 24, you see that Christ is risen. You see that he's um, shown himself to the woman. Peter comes running along. The road to Emmaus happens, um, where these two disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus, and Jesus breaks the bread and reveals himself to them, um, and, and then disappears. And then he reveals himself to the, to the apostles. Um, and in verse 44 then he said to them these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures and of course that's exactly what we pray for even this morning that the Lord would open our understanding that we would understand the scriptures in light of what he wants to do in our lives even today verse 46 then he said to them thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, which was the Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you have endured, until you are endured with power from on high. Verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So we get the beginning of Luke and we can see the end of Luke, the end of Luke's gospel. For the gospel of Luke, we see Jesus ascending. And that's going to be important as we come uh, back to Acts chapter 1. So the former account we can see is the Gospel of Luke. It's the same, it's the same writing style, it's written to the same person, um, and, and it's what's being referred to, and all of the early church absolutely believed that. In fact, the two books were linked together in a double volume, two volumes of, um, of, of works. The former account I made. So, who is the I in the book of Acts? We, we, we're all gonna say it's Luke. And then we ask ourselves, why do we say it's Luke? Well, it's because somebody told us that it was Luke. Well, what, what does the Bible have to say about that? Very little, actually. If you go into Blue Letter Bible or, or any other similar source, Bible Hub or Bible Gateway or whatever it is that you like to use, eSword, whatever your online search engine is, perhaps it's just Google, watch out with that. But if you, if you go onto any one of these sources and you open the Bible and you type in a search for the word Luke, Depending on your translation, it's only going to come up two times. It'll come up in, um, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and it'll come up in Colossians chapter 4. Both times, Paul's speaking, and Paul's talking about either the beloved physician that we see in Colossians, or we see Luke, who was with him um, when Demas had departed, in, in Timothy. Philemon, uh, verse 24 also speaks of, um, of Luke, um, but that's uh, different in different texts. And so even if we left that one out and said that well, perhaps that one's contentious, we've still got those two places only that Luke is, is mentioned. Of course, in Acts chapter 16, verse, uh, verse 10, we start to see that, um, that the, the pronouns from they become we, and Luke joins in on the journey. The whole early church believed that Luke wrote the gospel 
bearing his name. The whole early church believed that he wrote the book of Acts as well, and those two were joined together in one single volume. But I want to tell you this morning that if his name wasn't Luke, it doesn't matter. You see, because God didn't write the headings, man did. And God didn't put the, the verse and chapter breaks in, man did. And anywhere in your Bible where you see a heading above a particular section, that's not scripture, it's in your Bible. You know, I found a mistake in the Bible the other day. It was a page number. That's not a mistake in the Bible though, is it? And yet somehow we get this crazy sense that this is the Bible, it's absolutely, the, its content is absolutely correct. There's, there's no denying in any way, shape or form that this is the inerrant, perfect Word of God. And we have to add in its original because we have a translation of that. And the translation and your and my understanding in our contemporary language may have made things slightly different. But if you're worried that that's a problem, get one of the hundreds of translations, use that one, and then get a second one, and a third one, or a fourth one, or get it online because you can have them all at the same time. And you can double check these things. And you can get a full sense of what's being said. It is perfect and inerrant. So, it's the former account which I, and that's perhaps Luke, Luke with a Gentile name. His name was Gentile, and so again, scholars believe that he was a Gentile. There is some argument that he was a um, Hellenic Jew, but, um, but his name certainly was a Gentile name. And so again, church tradition tells us that he was a Gentile. And we can get caught up on that. That can be special, and that can be troubling, and that can be all sorts of things, but it doesn't change the text. Numbers 22. Numbers 22, who spoke to Balaam? His donkey did. The Lord chose to use the donkey. We don't know the donkey's name, but that doesn't change what the donkey said. That doesn't change the impact that the donkey had. You know, it's the same with the donkey up here and every other donkey that's standing in any pulpit across the country. It's not about the donkey. It's about, it's about the Word of God. Right? And I'm saying all these things to encourage you towards the book of Acts. We need to look at these things and, and, and challenge. The, the Lord didn't call us to turn off our brains. In fact, he's turned them on in every sense. We are to ask and we are to check and we are to be Berean because we want to make sure that these things are true. If you're living in something which you're believing because you were told from somebody who was told from somebody who was told, and when you question it, the same answer comes just more loudly. That's teaching, isn't it? If you don't understand, I can speak louder. <laughs> that doesn't change the accepting heart of the message, does it? Don't investigate these things. Even as we're doing this morning, oh Theophilus, oh Theophilus, you can see Theophilus' title has changed. And so again, people are saying, well, he, he's now been saved and he's now one of the brothers and so his title has dropped off. Perhaps, but not necessary. Theophilus is a beautiful term that can perhaps even apply to you and I because it just means lover of God. And so it could be a pseudonym for somebody who was being protected or it could be an actual person. And I think either way it's quite beautiful if it's written on behalf of Theophilus who was a, a rich and important man. Luke who's the physician according to Colossians chapter 4. Luke, who's the physician, would have perhaps been owned by Theophilus because that's how physicians worked. You owned a doctor, you didn't go to a doctor, which as you get older is probably a, a good thing. Um, but Theophilus was, um, was, was this person that he was writing to. But for you and I today, lovers of God, perhaps he set these things in account on your behalf and on mine. And, and in a sense, that's absolutely true because the Bible is good for us. It's good for us even today to learn from. And so we haven't got out of the first verse yet, but we're going to look at all of the things that Jesus, and there's not too much contention around this, but if you've just picked up the New Testament, if you've just picked up the book of Acts, this is the historical, verifiable, absolutely factual Jesus. The same Jesus that you'll find recorded in the Quran. The same Jesus that you'll find recorded in world history. The same Jesus that there is no dispute lived, walked, breathed at the exact times that the Bible is reporting. So that's the Jesus that we're talking about. And you and I can take those things for granted, but it's an important thing. Pick up the New Testament, open to the book of Acts, start reading, and it can be confusing. 
And if it's not confusing and we're not questioning these things, then we have to ask ourselves and we have to, we have to encourage a scratching into our own paradigms and perspectives where they come from and allow the Lord to change these things and reshape and mold them because all too often we shape and mold the Bible into our paradigms rather than allowing it to shape our paradigms the way that the Lord's intended it to do. So great encouragement. It's that all Jesus began to both do and teach. Notice the wording there. It's not that all Jesus did and taught. It's a nuance, but do you see that? It doesn't say, I've set in order all the things which Jesus did and all the things which Jesus taught. Because if he had done that, the things which he did and the things which he taught would have been past tense and they would have been finished. But these are the things which he began to do. And there is no end. He's still doing them today. I pray he'd be doing them in your hearts even this morning. But these are the things which Jesus began to do and to teach. The Gospel of Luke is what he's referring, referring back to, the former account. These are the things which Jesus began to do. They haven't concluded in any way. Verse 2. When did he do it? Well, we've just read that in the end of the Gospel of Luke. Until the day in which he was taken up, that's the ascension into heaven, which again we saw in, um, uh, in, in, in Luke's gospel, but also in verse 9 of, of Acts chapter 1. If you pop just either across or down to wherever that is, um, verse 9 will give you that when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and received, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And so Jesus ascended into heaven. After he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commands or commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. After Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. And there's an interesting term, isn't it? So Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gave commandments to the apostles. And again, we've just picked up the Bible for the first time. We've just opened it to the book of Acts and we've just started reading and we've done our Googling so we know that uh, the former account is the book of Luke. We know that the author seems to be a man called Luke but if his name was pronounced or said differently that probably doesn't matter too much but Luke being the author, Theophilus is the same person that's receiving these and it doubles for us because he's a lover of God. Jesus who is Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus, the Jesus that we know um, that the Bible teaches us, he gave through the Holy Spirit some commandments. But what's this Holy Spirit all about? What, what's going on here? What is this Holy Spirit? It sounds like, let me go and do a little bit of reading. Ah, it seems like the power of God. It seems like this is the, this is the, the power, the entity which, with which God sort of achieves his purposes on this world. But that wouldn't be correct, you see, because it's the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity. It's not just the power or the entity by which God operates in this world. It's the third person of the Holy Spirit. Well, how, how, does, that, how does that come about? How can, you, how can you tell that that's the case? If you've got a pen, I'm going to have ten different things um, and some references you might want to have a look up. But the Holy Spirit speaks. Entities don't speak so well. Powers don't speak so well. Electricity doesn't speak so well. Of course, if you push it through a speaker, it does a, it does a fine job, but that's a completely different concept. An entity like the Holy Spirit speaks. So it's not an entity. He's the person of the Holy Spirit. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 2. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. He intercedes. The Holy Spirit will intercede for us. Have you ever seen an entity or a power interceding for somebody? That's Romans chapter 8, verse 26. He testifies. He will testify to us. Reason with us, in a sense. The Holy Spirit will testify of all things that Jesus said. He will bring them to remembrance. You remember this from John 15, specifically verse 26. So he testifies. He communes with us. He communes with us, but that's also got a sense of testifying. He communes, he lives, he, he, he exhorts, he pushes us, he drives us. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 16. You can strive. Have you ever strive, strived with electricity? Have you ever strived with, I mean, in, 
in a sense, I suppose we could make that work in English, but it doesn't, it doesn't make any, it doesn't work, does it? But you can strive with a person. This is the person of the Holy Spirit. You can strive with the Spirit. Genesis 6, verse 3. You can resist the Spirit. Again, resisting electricity, resisting the wind, resisting waves. It's a theoretical, but it's not in context. In context, you're resisting a work, a dynamic, a changing, a person-like work. You can resist the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Can be vexed is the is the word in the old king james you can grieve the work of the holy spirit we see that in isaiah 63 verse 10. you can blaspheme the work of the holy spirit you can blaspheme the spirit and we see that in matthew 12 22 to 32 you can see that the the, the spirit can be blasphemed the spirit does miracles The Spirit does miracles. Romans 15, verse 9. Of course, resisting the Holy Spirit, we remember from Acts chapter 7. I didn't give you that reference, but Acts chapter 7, verse, verse 51. Where was that? Well, that was Stephen speaking to, speaking to the council of Israel, saying, you've always resisted the Holy Spirit. You've always resisted the truth of God. And the last one, he can be lied to. We remember Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. You can lie to the Holy Spirit. This is the person of the Holy Spirit. So it's through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, as we've seen through our study in John, that Jesus gave these commands. And if you wanted another proof, albeit subtle, that this is the same authorage, as the book of Luke. The book of Luke speaks to the humanity of Christ who would be constantly in prayer with the Father and working through his, um, let's, let's call them um, um, earthly means, which was access to the Lord's power through the Holy Spirit. He wasn't working in his deity as we see um, recorded in places in the book of John. But we see here that through the Holy Spirit, again, the same author focusing on the same qualities, Jesus has given commandments. And again, we ask what those commandments were. And we know that Jesus has told us through the book of John that if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And we can go and have a look at all of the various commandments. But we actually just read them in the end of the book of Luke, didn't we? So the very basic ones that, that, uh, that, that were finished in the book of Luke are um, in, in verse uh, 47. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That was sort of the parting commandment. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of Christ. The Holy Spirit would again confirm all of these things. But Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gave them commandments which needed to be followed out. He gave commandments to apostles. We're going to do this again. Who are the apostles? And again, we know this. And it's an important thing for us because how many disciples were there? Hundreds. There were thousands before Jesus said, drink my blood, eat my flesh. We don't picture it that way. He had thousands of disciples. He had, he had instituted communion. And unless you eat, eat the flesh, and unless you drink the blood, you've got, you're going to have no part with me, he says. And they were like, whoa, this is too heavy for us. And, and many of them disappeared. There were 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost, but there were originally 12 apostles. And we get that from Luke chapter 16, sorry, chapter 6, verse 13. Jesus up all night, again in his humanity and in his dependence on the Father, a beautiful picture and example for you and I, prayed all night about the apostles to choose. He called from his disciples these 12 apostles and he named them as apostles. Amongst them was Judas, who killed himself. But the remaining 11, the remaining 11 were apostles. An apostle means one to be sent out. It's the sent out ones. So he gave these commands, the 
final command that Luke recorded for us to go out and preach repentance and remission of sins. And, and that's, that's the true gospel, isn't it? The true gospel is there is remission of sins with repentance. With repentance. Not, Lord, that's a great offer. And I see grace. And I think I can make this work. You see, every time I go and do something wrong, I'm just going to come and say sorry. You, my friend, are not genuine. You have not understood. The gospel is repentance and remission of sins. It is amazing grace. It is unbelievable, unmerited, unearned, amazing grace by faith alone, in Christ alone. The recipe is we give up this life and hand it over to him. There is repentance and remission of sins. And that message has to be clear. It has to be clear. You know, sometimes and in some places, our desire to see people's hearts and lives changed for eternity means that we'll give them a gospel which doesn't include the repentance portion. <laughs> and if you missed out the repentance portion, you have ill-served that person. The gospel is so attractive, and I'm not suggesting you do this, but it is so attractive that you've almost got to unsell it. We've got this sales mentality in so many ways when we try and give the gospel. Right? And, and praise the Lord is because many times of the excitement and the zeal and the incredible things that the Lord has done in our own lives. But there is a giving up. It's nothing in comparison to what comes back. This peace and this joy and this eternal security, it's nothing in comparison. But let me tell you, the person that you're saying this to, they're still carnal until they have Jesus. Stop selling the gospel. Give people truth in love. That's what was commanded through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. We see at the end of the book of Luke, we see it confirmed now in the beginning of the book of Acts, that through the Holy Spirit, He had given them commandments, these apostles, these ones which were chosen, that he was to send out. And these um, apostles he's presented himself to as well. So verse 3, um, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. So we know who it's written to. We know where the previous work comes from. We know who Theophilus is. We know the author. We know who Jesus is. And that's an important starting place. We know that it's the literal, real, verifiable, historical Jesus we know who the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Trinity, who has given commandments to the apostles who we know who are. And now these apostles, not just has he given commandments, but he's done it in physical person. Jesus is alive. When we stand and we sing as we did this morning, we're singing it to a risen Savior. And as we go and we look through the book of Acts, this is what encouraged and drove the early church. What can you do to somebody who has nothing to lose? I read that Sun Tzu's book, The Art of War, years ago in a different time. And there's some stuff in there that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're going to go to war, you have to make sure that the person that you're going to war with has something to lose, has a way out, has an opportunity because when you put somebody in a position that they have absolutely nothing to lose, you're in a lot of trouble because they have nothing to lose. And if you do, well then you're the underdog. In Christ, you and I have nothing to lose. Do you get that this morning? In Christ, you and I have nothing to lose. I've got a house, I've got a family, I've got... In Christ, get your eyes off the, off the temple. Yes, you've got to steward these things. Yes, you've got to be good to all the things that He's given you. That, that, that's not what we're talking about now. But in Christ, your eternity is absolutely secured. And you are free. It's for freedom that Christ set you free. Who can stop you? Who can stop you? Who can stand against you? They couldn't stand against the early church who individually messed up as much as you and I do. They were unstoppable. And this little band 
filled with the Holy Spirit, has changed the world to the point that you and I are sitting here on a Sunday morning. He can do the same with you. Pray he does the same with me. He presented himself alive. Question that and hold the thought. After his suffering, what suffering? Well, we just need to go back to the Gospels and we can investigate that. We can see his physical suffering. We can see his rejection. You can see him being spat on. You can see him being crucified. But I would encourage you to look at him on the cross where the eternal wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. If you want to see suffering that's unknown, go and read the horrors of the reality of hell, which the Bible teaches as a literal place and reward for those who have stepped over the body of Jesus. Let that scare the living daylights out of you and then recognize the suffering of Jesus, who for every one of us consumed that, took it on himself, paid the price. That's the suffering. That's the suffering. Yes, there was a carnal suffering. Yes, there was a physical suffering. But he suffered the righteous, eternal God he suffered his wrath against the sin that you and I and every other human being who would come to him. He's taken that for us. That's his suffering. And he's done it, this presenting himself alive after the suffering. He has done by many infallible proofs. English kind of fails us here. The word infallible proofs is one word in the Greek. Infallible proofs, it's tech merian. Something like that, I'm probably saying it wrong. Infallible proofs, tech Marian. It simply means this by something which is surely or undeniably known, it is an indisputable evidence or truth. World history records Jesus. <laughs> Other works, the Quran being one of them, which is generally antagonistic records Jesus. Jesus is recorded in, in many, many sources and we know that he's a historical, verifiable figure. Legal systems around the world have always taken two witnesses to establish a fact. Undeniable, infallible proof that Jesus was alive can be found the whole way through scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, in fact, get your finger in that place, I'll read the rest of the text and we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and perhaps we'll end with that. But many infallible proofs, being seen by them, and that's part of the infallible proofs, being seen by them and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, which was ultimately his message. Ultimately, it was going to be repentance and remission of sins, again, the things of the kingdom of God coming into the presence of the almighty God, the creator of the heavens, the earth, the seas, everything in them, the perfect God, only through faith in Christ. So 1 Corinthians 15, how do we know, how do we know that, that there was an infallible proof, a perfect proof, that this Jesus who is proven and known and not even disputed amongst the nations and the world today, he lived, he breathed, he suffered and he died, nobody's arguing, and then he rose again undeniably rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to take a run at it from verse 1. So, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And so this is Paul writing, and Paul would write to the Galatians as well, and in Galatians chapter 1, particularly verse 8, he'd say, this gospel that I've given you, that is justification by faith in Christ alone, adding nothing to it for your righteousness, that's the gospel which you hang on to, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, importantly, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, not because he thought it was a good idea, but because God ordained it, and that he was seen by Cephas. He was seen by one man. 
But then he was seen by 12. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. And that's at the time that Paul was writing this. So it was verifiable. You could go speak to somebody who was still alive that had seen the risen Jesus and was prepared to die for that testimony. How many testimonies do we have? Even today, you can go in Fox's Book of Martyrs and the likes. You can go and see people giving their lives for Jesus because they've seen Jesus, perhaps a little bit like Paul has seen Jesus. These people physically saw him with their eyes. Not only did they see Jesus, he wasn't an apparition. He ate fish. He ate honey. He ate with his disciples. They remained to the present day. But some had fallen asleep. Some had, uh, some had died. And then he was seen by James, his brother. <laughs> Poor James. Growing up with Jesus, not knowing that he was God. <laughs> James writes about the, uh, the tongue coming in a cage. I think he probably needed that after recognizing that all the things he had said to his older brother, he was actually saying to God. But he was then seen by James and then by all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me also. As by one born out of due time. And that's when um, Paul saw him in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. There's 10 accounts of the risen Jesus. Twice by the 12. Or the 12 is the, is the name given to them. But on, on one occasion, 10 of them were there because Thomas wasn't. On the next occasion, Thomas was there and they handled him. He offered himself to be handled. We see him and we've just been through this in the book of John. The seven of them fishing. At the sea where you would have breakfast with them, the two on the road to Emmaus. These are the infallible proofs. You know, somebody could be put to death on the witness of two. Here we've got 500 at once. The Bible records are on 10 different occasions that Jesus was seen by people. It's an infallible proof. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. You know, for me, it's a difficult message this morning because it doesn't, it doesn't preach fancy. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't flow. It doesn't come out with a story and a, and a great punchline. Except that it's the Word of God. And what it's exhorting us, what it's exhorting us, particularly these three verses, is to make sure that we know for a certainty the things that matter and then put them into practice. And we put them into practice. If Jesus is alive, and he is, it's proven. If Jesus is alive, it changes everything. We have nothing to fear. Yes, carnally, they might laugh at us. The family might scorn us. There might be difficulties and troubles carnally. But if Jesus is alive, it's got to change something internally. And it changes everything eternally for you and I. Let's pray to God. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you, Lord, knowing how perfectly you've saved us, Lord, we know that everything that was necessary, Lord, not just for us to be reconciled to you, but even for our guilt and our shame to be removed from us, as far as the east is from the west, you've set us free. You've called us into relationship. Father, some of us you've called to tell people about this great love. Some of us you've called to show people. Some of us you've called, Lord, to, uh, to live as an example or to minister to, to young people or to old people or, or, or in some way, shape or form, Lord, you've gifted us, you've established us. Lord, none of this is of us. We pray, Father, that we would sit at the foot of the cross of Jesus that you would fill us to all the fullness that you have for us, Lord. That you would gift us. Lord, call us and show us your purpose for us. That as we see the picture of the early church start to unfold before us, Lord, powered and empowered, charged up with zeal in great assurance that you are alive, help us too to go out and to affect the world, perhaps even just a small bit of what these people Men of like flesh and evil passions, just like us, Lord, would have achieved only through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray as we commit ourselves to you, Lord, that you would look favorably on us, Lord. Fill us afresh and anew with your Spirit, Lord. Protect us and keep us. 
Lord, if you tarry another week, we pray that you bring us back together safely. And all these things we ask in the name of our risen Messiah, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.